Thank you for taking the time to watch this episode of Life Support. If you enjoy the content, we would ask that you like it, hit subscribe, and share it with your friends. Hi, it's good to have you on Life Support. What we do in this program is we talk a lot about redemption. We're not afraid to talk about suffering and trauma and how God interacts with that. And we believe that when times are hard, that's when Jesus really makes himself known in new and exciting ways. So I'm glad you're here. I hope you're encouraged today. Our guest is one that uh, we've met before, and he's on uh, a journey that only he can describe, but it's an amazing journey. God is doing some things that uh, you and I probably can't relate to, but he's going to talk to us about it. And David, stay. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Great to have you back. Great to now, be back. Yeah, it's great to yeah. have you back. And um, David is, um, you know, we'll put everything on the table, a good friend, and um, uh, we go to the same church. David um, and, and I have, you know, walked together at some level through this, and it's been a joy to mm. to watch how God has used you. So let's kind of re- retrace our steps a little bit so people can get caught up to where we are and why we're talking about this. Tell me yeah. where this particular journey that we're talking about, that being a cancer journey, mm. began. Yeah, so our journey began as a family, Lori and I and the kids, about six years ago, and uh, began with uh, just a really unexpected stage four colon cancer diagnosis in June of 2017. And uh, so we've been through lots of uh, treatment, as you can imagine. I mean, six years later, uh, lots of chemotherapy, lots of um, targeted therapy, liver-directed therapy, surgeries, et cetera. And um, interesting, I just did some reflecting on where we were a year ago. Uh, I think we had a certain idea of where things were maybe headed at that time. And and, and frankly, in some ways, I think hoping to avoid <laughs> yeah. kind of the path that we're currently on. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, God is faithful. I know we talked about that. Uh, last year, and uh, he certainly is and has continued to be. And so, so when you found this out, um, nobody wants to hear that. It's we yeah. all think it's not going to be us that hears it. What went through your mind when you began to grapple with the fact that you were now, uh, you now had cancer and you had quite a journey ahead? Yeah. You know, I think the first thing that went through my mind, and I remember sharing this a year ago, is, um, I just had that sense of like, just falling, Mm. you know, Mm -hmm. like in that moment, sitting with the surgeon, um, being told, you know, David, you have a colon, you have have a tumor in your colon that spread to your liver, you have stage four cancer. I don't know that there's anything that can really uh, prepare you for that moment. I mean, at least kind of that initial shock. And I think I shared last time we were together that I almost passed out, Mm -hmm. right? It was so shocking. I just didn't... um, really consider the gravity of, of the diagnosis at that point. Um, one of the things I just was sharing with uh, a friend last week as we were walking the neighborhood and talking, and uh, he's a good friend, and he and his family really been caring for us. I didn't share this before, but, you know, I had some fears. And um, one, probably one of the greatest fears that I had at that time was that my kids wouldn't remember me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my kids were, I think they were eight and 10 at the time. And, you know, I, I remember certain things about being their age, you know, these little kind of pictures in your mind of you sure. know, playing baseball or whatever. Right. Yeah, but I just, sure. I, I, I had, I had some real fears that, um, that I might not survive and that my kids might not remember me. Yeah. Well, you know, when you go to funerals, memorials, um, and I remember when we were at my son's uh, memorial service, um, almost every speaker ended that with, you will not be forgotten. Mm-hmm. We will not forget you. And because everybody knows the proclivity of a human being is to just move on. And I understand that that must have been terrifying on a whole lot of different levels. Yeah. To think about your kids not remembering you would be terrible. Yeah, yeah. And it just made every... It made every moment from that point forward different. Um, I remember the first uh, Saturday, you know, so we got that kind of 
gravity of the news on Friday. And I remember Saturday morning um, just doing something that we would normally do, which was just out in the driveway. It was a beautiful, you know, it was late June, early July, just a beautiful Saturday morning. The sun was shining and we were in the driveway washing cars. And I just remember how vivid that whole situation was, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it was uh, technicolor was kind of a word, you yeah. know? Mm-hmm. And so I'm out there and I'm washing cars with my, with my young kids. And, uh, I remember at one point as we were walking around the car, I was doing the washing and I think it was Madeline that was doing the rinsing. And I remember a few times she sprayed me with the hose. <laughs> and I remember, you know, it was uncomfortable. It was cold. And yeah. I just remember yeah. thinking, you know, I mean, Apart from the situation that we were in, it probably would have, probably would have even made me, might have made me a little frustrated, a little annoyed, right. a little angry, right. right? But in that moment, I just remember thinking, like, this is the farthest thing from anything that matters. Yeah. Right now. Yeah, that's right. Right? Like, what matters is this moment yeah. that we're in. And I've had some moments like that recently, too, and I can share some about that as we go. Yeah, you treasure those things. And yeah. now, you, you not only heard that you're now a... A cancer patient, but you heard stage four. Yeah. And so it's not like, hey, you know, we'll get this early and you'll be fine. Mm-hmm. So when did you start to realize as you began to process this that that your life was in danger? Yeah. I mean, I, on some level, I think I realized that in that moment when the surgeon said, you know, I've been thinking about this all day. I'm not quite sure how to tell you this. No, those right, are good words to hear yeah, to start with. Right. Yeah, like, the, the cancer in your yeah. colon has spread to your liver in your stage four. And um, it, you know, if you've ever, you know, and you have, uh, um, anybody who's ever received, you know, some rather startling, terrifying news, I think could could tell you that there's literally a, there's a physical bodily, like a jolting, Right. Like, I mean, literally, mm-hmm. like I just I, I felt, again, very much like that bottom was coming up, um, like I was falling. Um, I almost passed out. Through the course of the conversation, um, you know, we, we started to get some footing a little bit on the range of, of the possibilities. But, yeah, I, I think it was pretty. I think it was pretty immediate, mm-hmm. right? That we were dealing with something that we could not have expected or really comprehend. Yeah, and uh, well, it was scary. Yeah, I'm sure it Super was. Scary. So you you've been through um, now, uh, like you said, um, tons of treatment, um, different options, uh, lots of chemo. Yeah, you've really done a, a great job um, emotionally and being a testimony to others. And I admire you for that. And But now you're facing something that is something that most of us hear about on TV. <laughs> Tell us what's next for you, because this is where I think, um, you know, you probably didn't know this at the beginning, where God was taking this all along. Right. So tell yeah. me what's next. Yeah, so when we sat here a year ago, and I actually went back and kind of watched our, our, our episodes because I, I just wanted to remind myself of like, what were we thinking about? What were we hoping for? What were the prayers that, you know, we were asking for? And so a year ago, we were working with a group down at MD Anderson, and I had no evidence of the cancer at that time. And God actually answered one of the prayers that we asked for at that time. And we asked that um, a blood draw that I had had that was real proximate to our meeting together, uh, we asked that that blood draw would return a negative result, that there would be not only no evidence of disease radiographically, but in the blood, you know, microscopically, that there would be no evidence of disease. And that happened. And then that that rather quickly changed. You know, a lot of times when you're doing these tests, it's a, they talk about serial testing, right? So it's test and you test and you test and you're hoping, obviously, for consistency. And we we subsequently got a positive test we found out that um, I was likely dealing with another recurrence, right? So for the, I think it was maybe the fourth or fifth time at that point, right, that we had a spot on the liver. That was the perspective of the people at MD Anderson. And I remember uh, talking with one of our our local friends here who's a surgeon, 
and who's been with us from the very beginning of this journey. And, and we just really started to feel like we needed a new plan, right? Like it, it's kind of like uh, the watching and the waiting and the dealing with things on a sort of targeted and even systemic basis was probably not going to be successful mm-hmm. ultimately. And, you know, so his encouragement and, and, and our um, next steps were to get involved with a group at the Cleveland Clinic and to start considering whether or not we could be a candidate for transplant surgery. Um, some people, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, sort of refer to this as what they call the great resection, <laughs> right? So, right? So I've had uh, a handful of these uh, resections where they go in and there's a spot and they remove it and... You know, perhaps we do some, you know, kind of post-surgical chemotherapy on the other side of that. But um, so this is a case where what we're looking at is taking out the whole liver, right? It's not taking out a piece of it, but taking out both lobes of my liver with the goal, right? And we really believe that this is still in the realm of curative possibility, um, taking out the whole liver, um, we have a uh, what's called a living donor at this point. And so um, this person is uh, going to be, God willing, going to be parting with a part of their liver mm-hmm. that would then be you know, transplanted into me, um, again, with the hope that uh, we're sort of once and for all you know, going to mm-hmm. get to the other side of this and mm-hmm. that that cancer uh, will, will be gone you know, permanently. Yeah. Wow. What a... Uh, journey, you know, to think of where you were to where you are now and and what you're facing. Now, I know that when people think, well, that sounds great. You know, that sounds like, uh, you know, you just walk in there, get your new liver, you walk back out. But even to get ready for the surgery, to even be able to have the surgery, so many different boxes had to be checked. Yeah. And, uh, you know, having conversations with you and your wife about like, you know, well, this has to happen and this has to happen and that has to happen. Mm. It must at times seemed overwhelming um, yeah. to try to work. I mean, you're talking about insurance, you're talking about finding finding a donor and, you know, the tests that you talked about. Yep. Uh, and and w- something that struck me just now is when you said zero evidence of the disease. Mm-hmm. And I went to myself, I I thought... Yeah, but you were a stage four. You had stage four colon cancer. Mm-hmm. Like that's a miracle in itself mm-hmm. that you it can is. even say those words. Yes. Yeah. So we have we've been one of these. It's a, it's a rare case where you know you're diagnosed with metastatic disease and it's fairly extensive, and you not only get control, but then you get to this place where you know all the visible evidence of the disease has been removed, and we've been in that place five, six times by now. And <clears throat> yeah, what you said about the, even just in the last 12 months, the journey to getting here and just the, how unlikely it is, right? That, mm-hmm. that everything just day by day, week by week, month by month would fall into place. I mean, it all started by going out to Cleveland, having extensive evaluation myself. I mean, literally two days, I think it was nine appointments last October. And, you know, you get to the end of all that and they say, okay, you know, like, yeah, this looks good for you, right? Like, you're approved. Um, part of that conversation, too, then becomes how do you stay – how do you stay in the game? How do you stay in the window of you're eligible? Yeah. And so we've been on a six-month journey with chemotherapy, right, that has had lots of ups and downs, right? And some people call it maintenance therapy, but it's, it's challenging, right? I mean, um, and, and I think – even recently, like we've really started to understand that this is not a good long-term plan, right? Like long-term chemotherapy is yeah. not a good plan. Yeah, long it, it seasons, poisons your body. It, yeah. You know, people die from chemo as much as they die from the actual disease. Right, right. And, and mm-hmm. you know, statistically, we knew at, at the early part of the journey that if we were to go down this path with chemotherapy alone as the tool – in the box, it was highly unlikely yeah. to be successful. So, yeah, so we've been doing chemotherapy. In fact, I just, uh, I'll tell you, I just, you know this probably already, but um, just last week we celebrated uh, what we hope is the end of that chemotherapy journey. Yeah, I, that's we, great. We went through 11 cycles 
of chemotherapy from the middle of March until the middle of September here. And uh, so it was a really fun time sitting with our oncologist who's been with us from the beginning and just looking back at all that God has done. And now we not only, as you said before, right, like we've, we have a, a donor. And in fact, um, it took us three tries to get there. <laughs> and so uh, we, have, we have our donor. Um, and, and he and I just last night um, here at, at uh, in the midst of a lot of the ministry that's going on, we're, we're just, you know, talking back and forth about where we're at with all of that. And so, yeah, it's just incredible. Yeah, it really is. And you've got so many people praying for you. You've also had an opportunity to minister to other people who are who are fighting cancer, and, and many of them are in, in the same realm as you are, the kind of cancer that you have. Tell me the, hmm. the opportunities that God has given you to give back yeah. have been numerous, haven't they? They have. Yeah, you know, and that that started with uh, somebody else doing that for me um, right at the beginning of the journey. You know, I had a guy named Matt who um, very providentially, just through relationships, you know, his and, and mine, um, sat down, you know, and had lunch with me at, at uh, one of the local restaurants here and just became a great encouragement for me. Um, and then, so yeah, so as, as, um, as we've become aware of the situations of others throughout this journey. And as people have wanted to make introductions simply for, for the purpose of encouragement and sharing, you know, kind of mutual experiences. Yeah. We've, we've really tried as best we can to say yes to those opportunities. And even this morning, um, I was on WhatsApp with, uh, with a fellow who's uh, actually doesn't even live in, in the U S he lives in a, um, uh, a virgin, I think it's a Virgin Island territory. Mm-hmm. And uh, as God would have it, he uh, was a friend of my brother's. And, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, we've been walking with him for the last several months as uh, as he's been get, trying to get clear on what his diagnosis is and get on a, you know, get on a treatment path. And um, it's been incredibly rewarding, mm-hmm. you know, Um to just walk together, you know, with others on the journey and talk. And, you know, we talked about this a little bit last time, but, you know, just to share about the faithfulness of God in and through all of this. Um, we've we've been doing this for over six years. Yeah. And our situation, which, again, we never thought we would be in this situation of, like, we're on the verge of a living donor liver transplant with the, with still the hope of getting to a, a curative place, that picture and that image for people that are very early in the journey mm-hmm. is very powerful, mm-hmm. right? I mean, yeah. it, it just it, it gives them at least a range of the possibilities of what they might have to look forward yeah. to. Yeah, there's something worth fighting for here. Right. 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 Yeah. Sometimes what what uh, what, what we hear, and I'm, we're very thankful that this was never part of our story, is that you know a, a well-meaning medical professional, maybe it's an oncologist or, you know, a surgeon or somebody will, will, will have a very frank conversation with a person and almost set a tone as though they know how this is going to go mm-hmm. and, and they know where this is all going to end up. <clears throat> Our story then becomes one of just emphatically no, right? Like you don't know and they don't know, right? And only God knows, right? Yeah, and so, only God um, knows. Yeah, it's just it's been uh, it's been uh, an honor, really a privilege, to be used by God in that way, and gives us a great purpose mm-hmm. in all of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, you have some credibility that other people don't have to speak in into their lives, and it's it's so uh, wonderful to know that your suffering is already paying off because none of us can see all of God's plan. Mm-hmm. Um, but we get glimpses of it yeah. and we, and and we think, Oh, well, maybe that's one of the reasons that I am suffering. Yes. And that, that in itself is enlightening and encouraging and empowering mm-hmm. as you fight this stuff. Yeah. We had a, uh, we had a donor family that said that very thing to us. Um, <clears throat> as they were going through the process of evaluation and 
And they said, you know, we always talk about that verse from Romans that, you know, is the, you know, how God works all things together for good for those yeah. who love him, who have been called mm-hmm. according to his purposes. They told us, they said, David, we, we see how your suffering is being used for our good. And that's super powerful, yeah. right? Because, I mean, God doesn't, mm-hmm. um, he doesn't have to show us anything, yeah. right? But so many times, again, you know, he's, he's revealed, you know, given us these glimpses, like you said, of what he's doing, how he's working. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a huge privilege. Yeah, it really is. All right, so here's a really difficult theological question. <laughs> and you got two minutes. Okay. All right. This is like Ask Pastor John or something. Love um, it. Um, if all of this wouldn't have worked out, mm. would God still be faithful? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I it's a great question. And so the short answer would be yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's probably the right answer. Yeah. I, th- um, I think the expanded answer would be uh, I've often shared with people just honestly, it's really hard for us to how to know how would we have been? How would we have responded? What would have happened if things hadn't gone the way that they have? Mm-hmm. Right. So that's kind of like the great disclaimer or caveat or asterisk, right? It's right. like, I don't know. You know, I'm confident. I know that God would have kept me. Yes. Right. I mm-hmm. mean, we talked about that last time. He yeah. would have been faithful to do that. Um, yeah, it's interesting. You know, you and your your wife and I were actually talking about this recently. Like, what does it mean, the faithfulness of God? What does that mean? What does mm-hmm. that really mean? It's more than provision, right? And it means that that whether whether God had brought us to this point or not, He would have still been good on His promises, mm-hmm. right? He would have still been faithful. He there are things in His Word that He has said, and He is going to do it, mm-hmm. and we know that. And so, I mean, I, so that's, you know, um, that's, that's true, right? He said it. It's true. We believe it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I knew that's what you would say um, because that's just who you are and that's what you believe. And I think sometimes when we run into suffering, we have a fork in the road and we just make a decision. No, this is where I planted my flag. Mm-hmm. This is what I believe. Mm-hmm. This is who I am. Yeah, this is who God is, and nothing's going to shake me off this. You know, I might struggle. I might ask questions. I might have days that are dark. Yep. But you know, um, this is when we talk about God's faithfulness, and like you said, holding you close, not allowing you to slip through His fingers. Mm-hmm. Because frankly, at times when you're going through something like that, you have no power to do it yourself. You're just totally reliant on God. And he always comes through. Yeah. And he's come through for you, for sure. Because yes, you're still, has. you're not only the same person that you've always been, but, um, you know, I can see how this has grown you and, and given you uh, a, a depth and a perception of things that maybe you wouldn't have had before. So, mm-hmm. listen, we're going to have a lot of people that are watching and listening right now yeah. that are going to be praying for you as you head for your transplant. Yep. Um, we'll make sure that we update this uh, wonderful audience. Um, on how that goes. Okay. And um, I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing your story. It's encouraging to many who are listening, I'm sure. So yeah. thanks so much, David. You're welcome.